All right, what is up everyone? Again, we have our Q&A. A uh, couple topics today. We'll talk a little bit about the video I just posted. Um, I'll actually just share the picture of it right now. So I was doing curved runs today. And one of the cool things about curved runs, I'll share some photos here, is that you can see that when I'm running, can I move my little, mm, I can't unfortunately. You can see the lean it places on your body. So that lateral lean when you're doing curved runs is what makes these curved runs so difficult. So often when we train, we just train in a linear fashion. So going straight ahead. Um, yeah, we go side to side sometimes, but rarely do we do anything that is curved. And so when it comes to running and sprinting and jogging and the actual sports we play, we never actually run in a straight, well, we do run somewhat in a straight line sport, but if you're playing like basketball or whatever, oh, pick your favorite sport. Very rarely do you just run in a straight line. There is some curved ability to running, the ability to lean laterally side to side, move in that fashion. And so you can see here is that, let's choose a different video, is that the, play, the demand it places on my body and my ankle is pretty wild. Look at that shoe, by the way. Um, the shoe on that right there is such contorted mess. My foot isn't it's planted, but it's placing a lot, a lot, a lot of demand on that ankle, knee, and hip to maintain stability as I cut through that curved run on the top of the key. We'll even go a little bit closer and look at a closer view. You can see the foot right there. My shoe is basically rolled sideways. Um, and it's a pretty interesting uh, way of loading the body without having to just go in a straight line. And you can see it visually. Uh, so I have some questions people wanted to join. And we'll see if people want to join and they have questions they can ask. And we'll hop right there. Stop sharing that. All right. As always, taking questions and... We'll do live videos and people will join and we'll see how that goes. So I think I accepted the video and we'll see if he joins our question. If not, we'll go back to talking about some of those curved runs, but you can add certain things into your training pretty easily that make it way more, more dynamic than just running straight ahead. Um, and again, the curved run is a great example of that. Do I do any mobility or static stretching? I don't. I don't do any mobility. I do some static stretching. I find that stretching my hamstrings helps me. I don't like have an infinitesimal amount of hamstring stretching I do. I'm not sitting there and gonna hold stretches for three minutes. And for some people, like stretching your hips, stretching um, your calves or hamstrings are great and they can really help them. Some people, there's like no benefit at all. And so I always recommend doing what helps you. I think so often people will go online and they want to find like the perfect recipe. Oh, this person does this, this person does that and look at them. Well, I know friends who just eat ice cream and chocolate all day and are extremely fit. Just because it works for them doesn't mean it's going to work for you. I cannot eat ice cream and chocolate all day. There's no principle that, uh, explaining why ice cream and chocolate helps them. Um, and so when it comes to training, and stretching or wherever it might be, you want to look for commonalities, not abnormalities. Um, you want to have the ability to look at like a group of, here's a great example, look at a group of Olympic athletes. And so often people go, oh, this athlete, um, Usain Bolt ran this one way. Like, oh, his spine moved like this or his head moved like this. Whatever, pick your favorite Usain Bolt did X. Well, anyone who's competing in the Olympics is already so far at the end of the spectrum of beyond elite that we should be looking at commonalities amongst them because they're all great. To be any of those athletes would be absolutely amazing. So if you want to look at things that might help you get to be that athlete, you want to look at what those athletes do commonly with each other because it's not very common to be an Olympic sprinter. And so we're already looking at an anomalous group. 
a group that is different than the rest of the population. And you don't want to look at anomalies within anomalies. You want to look at commonalities amongst differentiated groups. So like what's a commonality amongst people who jump really high, not what's a commonality amongst that one guy who jumps super high, but the whole group, the whole cohort of people who jump very high. It's the same thing with business and people go, they look at, uh, oh, well, this entrepreneur did this or this entrepreneur did that. Now, what are the commonalities amongst entrepreneurs that typically succeed in a certain way? And then you start to have the idea to understand uh, things or actions or movements or certain habits entrepreneurs have, whatever it might be, that are common amongst successful outputs. And then that's how you begin to identify certain principles um, that might be underpinning performance. Um, so it, it, it's something that people really need to consider. It drives me absolutely crazy that we don't understand that. Even as a society, you'll see people who will want to go on and they'll want to go find this one person who's done this one anomalous thing, who has only eaten this type of food forever, or they only, uh, you know, breathe a certain way. And in doing so, you're missing all the benefits amongst people who are also really healthy and have commonalities. If you've ever seen the show or read studies about blue zones, it's a great example. You don't just go to a blue zone. A blue zone is an area where people typically live a longer, healthier life than other areas. They don't go there and try and find the oldest person possible and find the one weird thing that one older person does. They go there and they try to study what's common amongst those groups. It's something like being physically active and having the ability to communicate with others in a community setting and some level of resistance. I think they said like walking up an incline on the steepness of the village. They didn't go to the blue zones and looked up, oh, who's going to be the, uh, uh, the oldest person here that does the one anomalous thing that eats this one fruit or vegetable. And we do that so often in strength conditioning. We do this so often in performance and life because we're attracted to anomalies. We like things that are anomalous, um, not things that are, uh, we never were built basically from a statistical standpoint to analyze large sums of data. If you think about our track of evolution as humans, there's never a point in time where you could have ever imagined that one human would be able to interact with as many people as you do on social media today, this one day, let alone that in a year or a lifetime. And so we've never experienced the ability to have so many different interactions at a time. And because of that, we don't have the ability to discern, we don't innately, it seems like, have the ability to discern between commonalities and abnormalities because typically what would happen was our cohort was so small from an observation standpoint, abnormalities were very important to understand because maybe you only interacted with 20 people. So you want to meet the, the one fast person. There's only one fast person. So you, you typically gravitate towards that abnormality and abnormalities also mean extremes, right? So maybe if you eat a plant, it makes you sick. That's anomalous. Um, you, you are more uh, drawn to extraneous or anomalous situations. And so this same observational problem occurs all the time in training and stuff where we have people who want to do a movement profile or whatever. And they say, oh, well, that big toe is not moving appropriately. So that's why you're dysfunctional or, or this, the way you walk is inappropriate. So that's why you're dysfunctional. And so you can't, you can't everything's always based around this uh, anomalous, not even bad, I call it anomalous because it's different identification system and then assuming anomaly is incorrect and then assuming that it needs to have some sort of fulfillment or some sort of reposition of that anomaly to a better state. And that's how you create a problem. That's how you create a solution and a product to sell something. And so naturally we have that over and over and over again, whether you go online and read articles or whether you have any experience in like raising children or whether you want to go buy food, you constantly run into the situation where people point out, oh, we have this anomaly or there's something that's slightly different. We deem that a problem and I'm here to sell you a solution. So something to think about, um, something to consider. And someone asked a question. They said, okay, so what's common if their, their interest is NBA? What's common amongst NBA basketball players? How would you begin assessing that? Well, it, you could go 
example, like NBA statistics and stats and look at stuff like that. Um, but simply you could look at like uh, their shooting percentages in certain drills. You could look at their ball handling ability, their skills, um, their, their ability to run an offense. You can like, it's, it's a little different than just saying like, hey, I was an NBA player. Cause you're not going to have necessarily access to an NBA player. So you could take some observational stuff. They're this kind of athletic. There's a minimal threshold of athleticism. No NBA point guard is going to be super duper slow at a certain height that's below a certain height. Anyone who's smaller is typically quick. Anyone who is bigger has more leeway to be slow. And so you can take advantage of the ability to just track observational and some anthropometrics and some speed data. And then from a skill standpoint, you always have to understand the function within a system because certain players might exhibit certain skills because they're required to do such in this system they're in. I play for the Phoenix Suns. It's going to be a very different demand than if I were to play for uh, the Brooklyn Nets and the Phoenix Suns. I'm just giving Kevin Durant the basketball and clearing out. I'm making sure the offense is being run appropriately. And so just as uh, observing one point guard in that setting, you might say, oh, well, point guard's job is to pass the ball. And then you go might watch a point guard for the Houston Rockets. And the Houston Rockets, they don't have the world's most refined offense last year, so they shoot a lot more shots and they score a lot more points. And you say, oh, well, a point guard's job is to score a lot of points. But really, a point guard is going to be someone who has certain physical qualities and the ability to use those physical qualities to then portray certain skills that fit within a system. And that's how you begin to break that down because in certain um, settings, you're going to have different needs, right? The quote-unquote anomaly situation or, oh, this point guard only passes the ball every time. So is that a commonality or uh, just not, uh, something that's anomalous, something that's happening just one time? Um, let's keep working here. When's the best time to incorporate isometrics? Well, isometrics are a great tool. They're used for many different purposes. You can use them. First off, there are yielding and overcoming. Yielding is when you hold a position. Overcoming is when you move or attempt to move, but you're pushing into an unmovable object, so there is no actual movement occurring. Of the two, a yielding is probably closer to a semi or quasi-eccentric an isometric into an overcoming pen or an overcoming isometric into an unmovable object is probably not like an eccentric. Um, what is interesting about both is because there's a constant tension on the muscular system. That is the contractile element. You have tension being drawn from the tendon. The tendon is taut and that places a distinct load on the tendon. Now this might cause an analgesic effect, which is a quote unquote numbing effect. And the research suggests that maybe three sets of 30 to 45 seconds is a reasonable amount to target a specific area. Um, that along with a pain scale to make sure it's not too intense. Then you might do certain protocols for like explosive isometrics, where you're trying to ramp up as quickly as you can, maybe fatigue-based isometrics, where you're trying to hold the position for a given period of time. So just like any training modality, you might say, well, what's the best setup for a squat? Well, an isometric is just a means to deliver a stimulus. So you can do it fast, you can do it slow, different positions. So just like any stimulus, like a squat, you have to discern what you're trying to use the isometric for. And then only from there can you actually begin to understand how to implement it, just like any other exercise. All right. Let's keep going through some questions here. Can you explain how does vertical force translate into horizontal velocity? How does vertical force, is, I'm not sure if that's a question regarding the physics of translation about how a downward vertical force maybe when you're running translates into a more a greater horizontal force is that in regards to maintenance of a system's stiffness. So when you're running and sprinting, you have to have some level of vertical stiffness. And then when you hit the ground, you have to then propel yourself. So there's a composition of both vertical stiffness and horizontal force output. And as you run faster, the time period becomes shorter and there's a larger striking of the ground, which might create more vertical stiffness. The actual translation of any joint, you can't, really, while vectors are vertical and horizontal, you can think about every joint is, um, has torque to an extent, right? So if you think about knee extension is a rotational movement, um, the uh, knee flexions, rotation, ankle, so on and so forth. You have some circumduction as well, maybe at the shoulder joint. Things don't just like push into the ground. So we're always uh, creating rotation that then creates a macro a, a summative force. So like if I push in the ground, the aggregate total force might be vertical, but certain joint, vo joint forces might not be quote unquote vertical. So there are some uh, 
differences between that. I hope that kind of answers the question. I didn't know if you're asking from like a physics standpoint, if you're asking from like a sports specificity standpoint. Um, yes, I will be saving these videos. I put them on my podcast. So you can check out my podcast, um, the Max Schmarza Project. I used to do a lot more on there, and I've just been taking these and putting them on there. So hopefully you guys enjoy them. You can follow up on them. I try to put them on YouTube as well. Hey, Max, I've heard through studies in person is better than online. Oh, like studies dead in school. It gotcha. Took a second. Um, I don't know. I th think yes and no. Some of the best learning I've ever had is just reading books. Um, and then some great learning I've had it has nothing to do with school at all. And just sitting down with another coach who's very informed on the topic. And we have a creative collaboration. I don't know if one is better than the other. I think it's more like the set that you're the setting that you're in, like who you're with. Um, the people that you're with, and then whether or not you are actually in a group of people who have similar interests to you because you go to school and they don't really study the things that you want to study, and it might be very boring. Um, or you might go somewhere where you're in person and the person you're learning from is very biased and maybe not as open. But on the same side, when you are left to your own and have to figure out what to study, there isn't much guidance there. And so while you might have interest in lots of different areas, information is hard to find which is not really hard to find. Let me explain to everyone really quickly how to find information online. So it's very simple. All right, and people, I'm not going to say Google. You're going to say, I'm going to have a, uh, let's just pretend it's like that. Oh, I bumped my phone, I'm sorry. Let's pretend it's like this. I want to learn about isometrics and I don't know where to begin. Actually, we'll say physics. I currently try to learn some physics every now and then and I say, well, I heard something called the Higgs field and I want to learn about the Higgs field. What is that? So I might go to YouTube right away and type in Higgs field. And I might go, okay, let's pick like the shortest, easiest looking video. So I pick the shortest, easiest looking video and I watch it and I kind of get familiar with the terminology and it's probably explained in a very uh, brief and not detailed manner. And I say, okay, well, do I want to learn more about the Higgs field or do I need to learn about bosons or whatever it might be? So then I might go say, all right, I'm going to go learn about a particle accelerator. So I go to Wikipedia and I learn about the particle accelerator. And I learn about a particle accelerator and how that was used to find the Higgs field. And then I learn about the actual original Higgs physics. And so now I begin to have a cascade of connected events starting with something very simple of interest that I just get familiar with the terminology. And then from there, I begin to progress into more and more kind of intense forms of learning to the point where I can deviate where I need to. Do I know Coach Hester? I've met Coach Hester at a presentation, a conference in Fort Collins, Colorado. Very nice guy. Awesome. And a great coach. Now, I don't know him personally, but I guess interactively, or interactive class, peers, what's the right word to use? I don't know. I've met him before. Um, which is more beneficial, to train at the football field or the beach? I'm not a big, well, if I had a beach to train, maybe I would go to the beach more because the beach is cool. Who doesn't like being in the sun? What's more effective if it's playing football, being on the football field? Sand, when you hit the ground, dissipates forces. The sand moves underneath you. It creates larger contact times. Um, it creates larger deformation. It actually changes how your system produces stiffness and learns how to produce stiffness from a neurological standpoint. A really simple example, an easy example, is you hop on a trampoline for four minutes, jump and jump and jump and jump and jump and, and then you get off the trampoline and take some steps, you're gonna have a mistuned system. Your system is tuned that it's gonna be super rigid and super stiff because the entire form of elasticity came from the trampoline itself. The trampoline is an elastic material, you become very rigid and stiff. The inverse is opposite. I mean, it's true, so if the uh, place you're moving on is very uh, like dissipative, and you might become more elastic. I didn't say that right, but you get what I'm saying. The point is the surface that we interact on is going to change and modify how our neurological tuning works. And so if you're riding on sand, it's going to change slightly how you tune your system, which may not be as beneficial. What's your favorite exercise to build elasticity, improve rate of force development? Sprinting's one of the best. It's one of the simplest to do. Plyometrics are great. Doing your sporting activity at high velocities. I see so many people who want to jump and run and sprint. Well, let's just say people want to jump high. That's great and all, but they often just operate at a speed that's kind of slow. They kind of just run and jump. And if you want to get better at jumping high and jumping at high speeds, you got to push your velocity. And so you can think about like a break point. Think about it like an arc. 
where I have my axis right here, and this is like no velocity, low velocity. Obviously, well, this is no, my Y is my velocity. No, it's not. My X is my velocity, my Y is my ability to jump high out of it. When I have like no velocity, I don't jump very high, but I can still jump just fine. Then I have higher velocity, I jump higher, and there's like an optimal velocity and height I get, so I run really fast and I jump high. And there's a point where my jump height actually goes down because the velocity becomes too high, and my system starts to decouple. Okay, that's totally fine. Maybe I can push that break point out so I can actually get better at moving faster and jumping higher by increasing my ability to handle higher velocities. And people don't do that enough in their training. So I think that's helpful. I'm not familiar with martial arts training at all, I'm sorry. Um, I actually do know some of the uh, Russian science in that area. Viktor Solyanov has some inter interesting papers on isotone training for wrestlers. Um, I've actually read those, and they're pretty cool. But I am not uh, familiar with anything about mar mixed martial arts training, at least to that regard, like an actual skill of it. Uh, we have some more questions I'm flipping through here. Okay. Okay. Through your experience, do you believe an athlete, someone who wants to continue playing basketball in their 30s, can make full recovery from non-surgical ACL injury? I think it depends. I'm not a medical practitioner. I don't give medical advice nor guidance. And I would always default back to someone who is more familiar with that system. I don't know the type of injury, how it occurred, and it depends. Um, I had an instructor who once didn't have an ACL. And so that was kind of interesting, but I don't know any details beyond that. Do I offer mentorships? I have had a couple interns in the past. That was a long time ago. I haven't done mentorships. I've thought about doing it because I think people would actually enjoy it. Maybe people who are interested in learning more would find it to be interesting. I don't know the scalability of it because if I do it one-on-one, -on -one, it takes a lot of time for myself. And I want to make sure that you learn enough, but at the same time, it's not a ridiculous price. And then if it's too many people, I don't feel like I provide enough information. To everybody. I do have EdgeU, which is a website myself and Paul Fabrics put together, which has tons of information on there. There's courses and free form topics and lots of other wonderful things on there that you should check out. Um, but in terms of my own mentorship, not at the moment. Um, what would you consider for an athlete who doesn't handle failure well? <gasps> um, hmm. I, I guess understanding the perspective. I know people is kind of corny. There's like the book, The Growth Mindset, and understanding failure isn't really failure at all. There's only so many people who can succeed, and they don't succeed for an infinitesimal number of times and a period of time. They're not infinitely successful. Everyone's career ends. Um, understanding why you're upset is important. Was it this, you know, is it, are there things that you can control or are things that are not controllable? what aspects of that failure bother, bothered you and just kind of being honest with the failure versus being avoided of it. So those are some things that are interesting. Um, I think that's going to be everything we have for today. I'm going to upload this, I think, to my podcast and possibly on YouTube as well. I appreciate you guys listening. I hope you enjoyed. As always, take care. Appreciate y'all. Peace out.